So today I'm going to continue some discussion of cutoff, but then switch topics to rate of escape and uh, relating that to mixing as well. So So here is one uh, very simple example. of cutoff, but it already illustrates one interesting phenomenon. So suppose we have uh, suppose we have a line segment and we move to the right with probability p to the left with probability one minus p. So this chain could could be periodic. Uh, so I mean will be so we always look at the lazy version, namely with probability half we stay in place and with probability half p we move to the right, half 1 minus p we move to the left. And um, so we're going to take a p to be bigger than a half, so there is a bias to the right. And so in all these things, there is a. So if we're doing when we're doing the lazy version, there's always a factor of two that uh, is uh, sometimes implicit here. So the the time to need so the hitting time from the left to the right will be n over beta. But again, for the lazy version, you have to double that. Um, and so the actual time to take into mix by the lazy version is twice n over beta, where beta is the drift. So, so in this case, because almost all the stationary measure is concentrated on the right, so the stationary measure grows by a factor p over 1 minus p as you move from left to right, almost all of it is concentrated in the, in the vertices to the, on the rightmost side, namely, you know, if I take the k vertices that are on the right, then the remaining stationary measure is exponentially small in k. And from that, you easily deduce that the mixing time is equivalent to the hitting time from the left to the right. And this is uh, classical to estimate using, say, the central limit theorem, uh, which will hold. Um, so you have to take into account uh, the reflections here and here, but uh, you can still deduce that the mixing time is n over beta, again, times 2 because of the laziness. Uh, so here is an occasion for one nice exercise. Um, show the uh, mixing time in L2 is so I'll write T mix L2 of epsilon is asymptotic to some a C constants times n a where C is strictly bigger than 2 over beta So in other words, while mixing time <coughs> here is determined by the drift, so it's n over beta again times 2, uh, if you want to mix in L2, it takes strictly longer than uh, to, mix, to mix in uh, total variation. Uh, note that there is cutoff here, namely this both in L1 and in L2. So, um, <coughs> so in L1, you know, T mix of epsilon for total variation is asymptotic to um, n over beta, again, times 2. Uh, this is true as n tends to infinity uh, for any epsilon. So the first order asymptotics don't depend on epsilon. But if you look at the L2 mixing time, there is again cutoff, so it's asymptotic to a constant n, but it takes strictly longer. So this very simple example already illustrates that L2, which is the most 
uh, often the most convenient analytically to, uh, to analyze. Well, this example is very simple in L1, but in richer settings, L2 is very easy, but you have to be aware that in settings of uh, bounded degree, like this one, uh, L2 mixing tends to happen later than L1. And you see uh, striking examples of this in uh, Eyal's uh, last talk, I believe. Okay, so with that, um, with that comment, um, so I'm going to maybe skip this uh, discussion of trees since I left it as an exercise. Um, but but again, say that uh, maybe I'll say the word. So. Um, I stated the exercise, and I think Eyal gave you the same exercise, to take a tree with n nodes. So n is equivalent up to, you know, well, it's about 2 to the k, where k is this depth. And uh, you know, it's twice that minus 1. And the question is, uh, to show there's no cutoff. So one way to show there's no cutoff is to show that T mix uh, okay, T mix of epsilon behaves like some constant that depends on epsilon times n, but let's not worry about T mix epsilon. So T mix of a quarter show that that is equivalent to n and show that the relaxation time is also equivalent to n. And this is, again, lazy, simple random walk on this tree. And this is a binary finite tree of depth k. All right, so the relaxation time is equivalent to the number of vertices. The mixing time is also equivalent to the number of vertices. And because of the uh, necessary condition for cutoff, you deduce that this case doesn't have cutoff or pre-cutoff. Okay, so often people think of confused trees and expanders because you know the infinite tree is in a sense an expander, but finite trees are very different uh, from expanders. And uh, so, while on um, <coughs> many expanders will have uh, cutoff on the regular trees, we won't. Okay, so. Um, so one problem that is uh, still open is to characterize cutoff in a way where we can determine it without very precise calculations. So um, we, we see that in this example, just by estimating mixing <coughs> time and relaxation time up to constant, we can determine that there's no cutoff. So to rule out cutoff, we can do rather crude estimates where we lose constants. But to prove cutoff, we don't have yet a general method that uh, allows us to do crude estimates, say the mixing time is this order, something, the relaxation time is that order, and because of that, we deduce that there necessarily is cutoff. So for positive results, we need something more. Um, so that's a problem that has, uh, you know, consumed us uh, for some years. Uh, one result in this direction, which I <coughs> will say more in the last lecture, is uh, uh, with Ridi Basu and uh, Jonathan Hermon. And this relates cutoff in the sense of mixing to cutoff in the sense of hitting large sets. So, um, so analogously to the mixing time, which says how close we get in total variation to a, di to a distribution, we can look at uh, hitting times of large sets. So what, so formally hit half of epsilon is the first time where for any starting point and for any uh, uh, target set A of stationary measure at least a half, the probability that we still haven't hit it, the tail of the hitting probability is less than epsilon. So it's very close to the notion of 
a mixing time, but the difference is instead of asking for distributions, we're asking for tails of hitting times. And as is uh, noted here, the point of using this definition is that it allowed us uh, to prove that f in the class of trees, uh, the conjecture of the conjecture that T max over T rel goes to infinity, um, this always necessary condition is actually sufficient for cutoff in trees. An earlier re result in this direction is uh, uh, with uh, Jian Ding and Eyal. Uh, we show that on I think this okay. Uh, <coughs> we showed that the on uh, for birth and death chains uh, the condition is sufficient. So this goes to infinity if and only if. Uh, if and only if there is cutoff. And uh, the same thing was proved earlier for separation. Uh, by Diaconis and Salof cost. So the historical uh, story goes the other way from what I wrote it. So the first result is that Konisal, of course, to consider not the total variation distance, but the separation distance that I described last time, and showed that on that distance, uh, the conjecture holds. If this ratio goes to infinity, then that's equivalent to cutoff. Um, and then in this paper with uh, Jan Ding and Eyal, we showed that on birth and death chain, again, both of these results are for birth and death chains, so those are just a Markov chains that move on a path. At any point, they can go left, right, or stay in place, but it's not simple random walk. So you have arbitrary transition probabilities uh, to the left, to the right, and staying in place. Um, and and in all these cases, to avoid periodicity, let's assume uh, laziness. In all these cases. OK, so that, uh, those were the first two results. And in particular, these results show that for uh, birth and death chains, uh, cutoff in separation is equivalent to cutoff in total variation. And then, in this uh, later work with uh, Basson Hermon, we showed the same thing holds for <coughs> trees. So by trees, I mean now not just simple random walk on trees, but any Markov chain where the, the underlying graph of allowed transitions is a tree. And it doesn't have to be a regular tree. So you have an arbitrary finite tree. And the only assumption is that the transition probabilities uh, are along the edges of the trees, but they could be arbitrary. Any chain like that is reversible. So, um, so again, in this class, there are no counterexamples. Mixing over relaxation going to infinity implies cutoff. Um, and one can somewhat generalize this, so both in, the, in this paper, both in birth and death chains and for trees, if instead of going to neighbors, you allow some bounded jumps, then um, you can still get the same result. So there is some regularity assumption there, so I don't discuss that generalization in detail, but <coughs> it can be generalized from nearest neighbor to some bounded jumps. Okay, so the technique of 
this proof relies on this notion of uh, cutoff for hitting times. So, so the so there is a hitting cutoff for a family of lazy reversible chains, if and only if the difference uh, hit half of epsilon and hit half of one minus epsilon is little o of hit half, say, of, of a quarter. This is an analog of the definition of cutoff, but now for hitting times. And <coughs> and again, the basic result is that it's enough to verify this type of uh, modified type of cutoff to deduce, uh, in fact, it's equivalent to cutoff for mixing, which is what we uh, usually care about. Um, the reason this sometimes, so this looks like, okay, we replaced one definition by another definition, why is this helpful? The reason uh, is that in some cases we can more easily identify what are the sets that's harder to, hardest to hit as opposed to what are the sets that take the longest to mix. So trees is one such case, and I won't give you the details of this proof, but I just want to illustrate what are the sets that are hard to hit in a tree. So given that I have an arbitrary tree, there's always a notion of a central vertex. So what's it? So a, a vertex is central. What does that mean? It means that if I take the tree T and remove the vertex V, so I take the tree and just remove the vertex V together with the edges adjacent to it, this, of course, will be a union of some new trees, which are the connected components remaining. They, they correspond to the degree of this vertex. Um, and all of these should have all of these should have stationary measure less than a half a the well, less than half the total station measure, which was, which was one. So, <laughs> so we want that when we remove it, no piece of the tree will be a will be larger than than half the tree. So, so they're always so. Here is one kind of easy. <laughs> Fun exercise, if you haven't seen it, show that for any tree, so this is a finite tree, a pi here, of course, is just proportional to the degrees. So the stationary measure um, for a simple random walk is given by the degrees. In general, we're talking about a tree with some transition probabilities, and pi is a stationary distribution for that. It's true. You know, in, in that generality, it's true really for any measure on the tree that there exists a central vertex. Can there be more than one? Yes. Can be. Can there be more than two? No, uh, at most two. So, <coughs> so if you have a tree like this, then uh, both of these are central vertices. But so there exists a central vertex, and uh, and at most two. Again, when adjacent? what they are, they are they are necessarily adjacent. Yes. So 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 the. Here is one exercise, and then um, the kind of moral, morally, what drives these proofs is the fact that the sets that are hardest to hit are the sets that are hiding behind the central vertex. So, if I have so for every central vertex and every uh, starting point x, I can look at the set of points uh, that hide behind the central vertex. So it could be several components here. So, for instance, if this is x, then these two components are hidden from x or separated uh, by the central vertex from x. 
So, so this set, which includes uh, the central vertex V and these components that are not the component of X, uh, form a large set of measure, at least a half. And this type of set is the hardest to hit uh, in a tree. And that's, uh, so because we can identify, so that requires proof, but because we can identify these sets that are hardest to hit, uh, we can analyze trees better than, better than other graphs. Questions? Okay, so uh, I want to say something about product chains, which are an important class. So, um, so if I have n different chains, often we take them to be copies of the same chain, like we do in the hypercube, then we can uh, define several natural chains on the product space. And one chain is choose a coordinate at random and then move in that coordinate. So formally, this is given by, so if we had original transition kernels pi on the ice chain, uh, then this lifts to the product space. So pi tilde will be a transition kernel which only moves the ith coordinate uh, and keeps the other coordinates in place. And then the chain is just an average of these pi tilde. Formally, what this means, we have n coordinates. Each one is a chain in its own right. We choose one of these uniformly. Of course, you could use other weights. And then we move in that chain. So, so this is a type of chain that's often used. And here is a here is one result. There are many versions of this result. I think the earliest is due to Diaconis cell of course, 96. Uh, the version I state here is, uh, in is actually written here for the continuous time version of the chain. I'll explain. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a very nice version in the work of uh, Eyal Lubetsky and Alan Sly and also in the work of Lacroix that I'll come to. So the version I'm stating here is actually a little bit different because it's a, this is the version that's easiest to prove. It involves, instead of the discrete time chain, the closely related <coughs> continuous time chain, where instead of a, doing what I told you, where we choose a coordinate random and move that, a, we do this with, a, we wait an exponential time and then, uh, so uh, exponential time with uh, mean one, and then we choose one of those coordinates. So it's equivalent to giving an exponential clock of mean n to each of the coordinates and having them all move independently. So that's continuous time is, you know, in, in some respects a little easier than discrete time because uh, it creates some more independence. But the type of results remains the same. I'm just stating the continuous one because that's the easiest to prove. And the basic thing you see here is the generalization of the hypercube result. So remember, in the hypercube, we had a mixing time of n log n over 2 uh, with cutoff. So in general, if you take a fixed chain and take the nth power of that chain, that always will have cutoff and we can uh, pinpoint where it is. So the, uh, <coughs> the cutoff time is, uh, so is n log n. The, instead of n log n over 2, there is another factor gamma, which is the spectral gap of the underlying, uh, of the underlying chain in one coordinate. So for the hypercube, the underlying chain was very simple. It was a two-state chain where in time one, you just move to the uniform distribution, right? So, because it's lazy, so at time one. So that chain has spectral gap, has eigenvalues just one and zero. So spectral gap of one. So in that chain, you get half n log n. The generalization here is, uh, you still get the half n log n, but there is this factor, uh, one over gamma, which comes from the relaxation time of the individual coordinates. So you see that when I take a large product, the mixing time of the large product is not determined by the mixing time of the individual coordinates, but rather by the relaxation time. So this comes back to the distinction between um, you know, classical Markov chain analysis and 
the more modern one. So in the classical one, one took a fixed chain, maybe with a million states, maybe with a hundred states, and drove time to infinity. And then the asymptotics really depended on the highest eigenvalue. In the you know, more modern theory, modern here goes back to 1980, um, we think of a growing sequence of chains and we're just interested to, um, to drive the total variation distance down to some fixed epsilon, not to really close to zero. And then the mixing time is not determined just by the highest eigenvalue. However, in this setting, when we take a large product, in order to get the total variation distance small on the large product, you really have to drive it to very small on each coordinate. Hence, the modern theory on the large product reduces to the classical theory on each coordinate. That's why the determining factor is the relaxation time in each coordinate rather than the mixing time in each coordinate. Okay, and this uh, theorem, so again, in the Markov chain book, uh, you can uh, find the proof of this. So I'm not going to give it here in detail, but I wanted to explain you know, where it comes from. One. Here it's really n chains uh, run independently. What? It's like n independent chains yes. run, run independently yes. with each other with this exponential time. Yes, exactly. Um, now, the way I stated it here, I wanted to keep the correspondence with the discrete time chain so that each coordinate had a clock of mean n. Often when we go to continuous time, we then also speed up. So we make each coordinate move at, uh, at, uh, with mean <coughs> 1 or rate 1. And then you will lose a factor n everywhere here in the mixing times. So just be aware, when people talk about continuous time, often they do this rescaling, which I haven't done here. Uh, now one uh, very, very nice and very general theorem by uh, Chen and Salof Kost says that if I have a discrete time a lazy chain or a continuous time chain, they have cut off uh, together, so uh, you can pass from one from one to the other. Uh, so and, and prove whichever version is more convenient in an application. Um, one direction of this is very easy, uh, or I should say, one bound in this direction. So if you can, so th it's easy given the lazy chain upper bound, it's easy to obtain a continuous time upper bound because continuous time chain can be seen as an average of the lazy chain. But the other direction is non-trivial, it's kind of a Tauberian theorem. So a, an abelian theorem is one that involves averaging, it's usually easier, so that's passage from uh, the lazy or discrete time chain to the continuous time chain is an abelian theorem, it's very easy, this was, uh, everybody knew this before that paper. The non-trivial thing here is to go the other way and to go from a mixing of the upper bound and a mixing of continuous time chain to the lazy chain, which involves some, uh, it's, it's an analog of a uh, Tauberian theorem or depolarization. Um, I should say that for reversible chains we can go further and uh, so in work with uh, Jonathan Hermon, we proved the conjecture of Aldous, which says that for discrete time chains, instead of doing the usual laziness device to uh, get rid of periodicity, you could just do one lazy step in the beginning. So again, this is only for reversible chains. Um, instead of looking at mixing time of the lazy chain or of the continuous time chain, you can just uh, take one lazy step in the beginning and then all the rest are just steps of the discrete time chain and that one lazy step is enough to uh, kill all the possible periodicity and you get a cut off in this revised one step lazy chain if and only you have cut off in the continuous and, uh, and the lazy chains. So this is only true for reversible chains, because for reversible chains, the only real type of periodicity you can get has period two. In a, of course, in non-reversible chains, you can get other periods, and, a, and this uh, one lazy step is not going to do it. Any? Okay. So 
So one other thing I will comment on is that the proofs for the uh, continuous, uh, the one, um, when one works with product chains, there's another metric I didn't uh, discuss, which is extremely useful, uh, which is the Hellinger distance, uh, which is written here again in the in our Markov chain book and in many other sources, you can find more discussion of this. But the key is of the Hellinger distance is that it behaves very well on products, much better than a total variation, and it can be bounded above and below by the total variation distance. Um, so, so I'm going to skip the details of this of this proof and just tell you one more thing about a product chain. So. Um, until now I discussed the easy case of a product chain where I take a fixed chain and take it to the nth power and that always has cut off. But another natural thing to do is to take a sequence of chains that is changing and for the nth one to take its nth power. So, so uh, for a while I believed that all such examples should have cut off. Right? So you take the nth power of a chain, but that chain is also allowed to vary with n. So, for instance, a <coughs> so one problem I mentioned, but let me officially give it as an exercise. In slightly different notation that I mentioned before. So look at the z, z deal, um, Okay, so uh, I'm going to take the uh, uh, say zk of n. So this is going to be a this is just going to be a cycle on k equals k of n nodes. So k of n is you know, at least 2, but is an arbitrary number. And then I take uh, then a lazy simple random walk on z k of n to the n <coughs> has cut off. So I make no assumptions on this k of n sequence except that it's always uh, bigger than 2. So it could uh, fluctuate. Arbitrarily and yet, so the point of cutoff, you know, can, uh, so the formula for the mixing time of the nth chain, you know, depends very much on k of n, but um, but there is always cutoff, meaning you know, t mix n of one recession over t mix of epsilon uh, goes to one. <coughs> so this is an example of chains that change with time, and uh, we take the nth power, and this always has cutoff. Uh, but it's not the most general example, and what Lacan showed is that, in general, the best you can say is that all any product of n chains has pre-cutoff with factor two. So, but, um, so this, uh, okay, so this is true, but uh, maybe it's better to think of, so in this, okay, in this notation, uh, epsilon should be close to one. <laughs> but anyway, this is true for any choice of epsilon. Um, And he first proved it for separation, and, and then for, it's true also for a total variation via the Hellinger distance. So the example that shows that this 2 is sharp, so the 2 cannot be improved, is actually a variant of the Aldous counterexample. So, and I'm not going to give the details on that. So. One thing that I still believe is that if you have, if the underlying chains 
that you take to the nth product are um, have sufficient entropy, then um, so there are some sufficient conditions that are still not articulated, which will show <laughs> cutoff you know, more general than this case. So, so there should be a theorem. There isn't yet a sufficiently general theorem that gives. A, so, so this is. I wouldn't call it an exercise, but more a problem a, to characterize when, a, if you take some, say, some graph g n and take it to the nth power in the same sense, when this has cut off. So it always has pre-cutoff, no matter how the GN change, um, as long as you know, you're doing lazy chains or continuous time chains. But uh, when it has cutoff, uh, well, in almost all examples, but again, not all. OK. Um, so the Laquan example, uh, maybe I'm not going to give it in detail right now. Um, and I want to tell you about one more tool uh, to prove cutoff. It's especially useful for separation distance, but can also be used for total variation. And this is the notion of a strong stationary time. So, <coughs> so given a Markov chain, we know what's a stopping time. Um, here, we're going to discuss stopping times that can depend on additional randomness. So, for instance, an important kind of stopping time to remember is a look at the hypercube example. Remember, we had the lazy hypercube. We had n coordinates and chose the coordinate at random every time. I can ask for the stopping time when I have I chosen all coordinates, right? So that's the coupon collector time. Notice that this is not a stopping time for the I mean, the stopping time, is, it, it, it is a stopping time, but it's not measurable with respect to the random walk on the hypercube itself. Because if I uh, chose coordinate 3 and, ch and then didn't flip it, because it's a lazy step, or I chose coordinate 5 and then didn't flip it, there is no evidence in the, in the movement of the chain. If I keep track of where is the particle, there is no evidence in the movement of the particle to whether I chose coordinate 3 or 5. But in the definition of my stopping time, I am looking at which coordinates I chose. So formally, it's a stopping time in an enlarged filtration where we are keeping track also of the uh, coordinates we chose. The key thing that keeps it a stopping time, it doesn't look into the future So in this enlarged filtration. So that stopping time is an example of a strong stationary time. So what does that mean? So not on, so first of all, at the time where it shows all coordinates, in the hypercube, the distribution is completely, uh, is completely uniform. But that's even true if I tell you how long it took. Right? So how long it takes, it's a coupon collector time. It uh, tends to be n log n. But suppose a I was lucky and I managed, this is very unli you know, very unlikely event, that I chose the first n coordinates I chose were all different. That could happen with a very tiny probability. But even on that event, when I chose all coordinates, the distribution is completely uniform. And if it took less or more time. So that's why it's called the strong stationary time. Contrast it with the notion of stationary time. A stationary time is one where at that time, the distribution is uniform, but it's not uniform if I uh, also condition on how long it took. So, let me show you an uh, example of a. So, here is an example of a stationary time, which is not strong. Choose, choose some node z 
distributed according to pi, so a random node z with distribution is a stationary distribution, and use tau is just the hitting time of z. So min t so that xt equals z. So obviously x tau, you know, it's equal to z, so obviously it has distribution pi. Okay, but um, you know, if I I know the starting point, say I'm x zero is here, and I chose I choose this z. If I'm told that tau is <coughs> two, then I know uh, uh, that the distribution is very, given that additional information. Distribution is very non-stationary. I know that I'm very near the starting point. So there's a distinction between stationary times and strong stationary times. Both can be used for mixing. So there's a very interesting fact that stationary times still bound the mixing time for lazy chains. So this is not at all obvious. Um, so the so for lazy chains, a T mix. So this is a, a result of Aldos from the early '80s. that t-mix is a lazy chains or continuous time chains. t-mix is bounded by a constant times uh, the expectation of tau. So, um, and to be precise, let's take the maximum expectation, I'm not writing it, but maximize over the starting point of the expectation of this uh, stationary time. Then the mixing time is bounded by that, assuming laziness. But um, uh, so that's a non-trivial theorem. There's a much easier theorem, which is at least as useful, which is that strong stationary times bound uh, the mixing time. This is because many natural stationary times are, in fact, strong stationary. So we saw one example for the hypercube. And uh, we'll see some more. So. So this is <coughs> dying. So, so here is a little argument that bounds the separation distance. So this quantity, 1 minus <coughs> t takes y over pi y, in terms of a strong stationary time. So for strong stationary time, again, uh, one characterization is that the distribution of time tau is stationary and it's independent of tau. So from that you can easily deduce, there's a one line deduction that if you have a strong stationary time, the probability that tau is less equal t and x t equals y can be decomposed as a product of the, this probability and the probability that x t equals y, which will, um, under this conditioning, which will give you a pi of y. So this is actually an equivalent definition of strong stationary time. Now, once you know that, if I want to look at this uh, difference, so this is just the definition of ptxy, and then um, we bound above the probability of xt equals y by throwing, adding the additional condition that tau less equal t, and then use this decomposition to just get a um, 1 minus the probability of tau less equal t, in other words, the probability of tau bigger than t. In other words, for once we have a strong stationary time, we can bound 1 minus this ratio by the tail of that strong stationary time. And notice that this is true for any target state y. The initial state x is fixed here, so when I write p of tau bigger than t, really this course represents this probability starting from x. So, so we discussed in the hypercube, the mixing time in total variation is half n log n. The mixing time in separation actually is n log n. And, uh, and this argument with that stopping time gives a sharp bound in that case. Now, um, okay, here we always have an inequality, but in some important cases, there is equality here. So what is, when do we have an equality if adding this condition doesn't, 
change the probability. And this is when y is a halting state. So maybe I'll um, give this definition. So again, Sx of t <coughs> is the maximum over y of this quantity, 1 minus ptxy over pi y. And the bound we saw two slides ago is just that Sx of t is always at most the probability of tau bigger than t. But there are important cases where you have equality, and that's when you have a halting state. So suppose you have a state, uh, so, so a halting state is a state where, so given a stopping time tau, a halting state is a state that I know, uh, okay, I fix a starting point, a halting state is a state that I know if I hit the state, then the stopping time must have already occurred. So I run the chain, and, and I have this tau, and a halting state is one where I can't hit it before reaching tau. So again, looking at our canonical example, the hypercube, suppose we start um, with all ones. So then the all zero state is, a and, and our tau is, as I just said, the tau is the coupon collected time when we touched all coordinates. Then the all zero state is a halting state because there's no way to reach the all zeros without touching all coordinates. Okay, so once I have a halting state, then the previous argument, uh, just in this inequality, I have an equality because x t equals y means that tau must be less equal t. So this step, which was an inequality, actually is, is equality. And so we get that um, this general inequality is, once we have a halting state, uh, it is as an equality, and it means that any, so we get a somewhat surprising inclusion. If we have a strong stationary time with a halting state, then it is optimal, meaning it, its tail, so its tail is, is smaller than the tail of any other strong stationary time. Okay, because for any strong stationary time, we have this inequality holding. And if a strong stationary time has a halting state, then this inequality becomes equality. So it means strong stationary times with a halting state are always optimal. Yes? So if you take the maximum over the left-hand side? So yes. But you can, you can take the maximum. But first, um, and then you would take the maximum also over the right-hand side. But first, we can look at optimality with respect to a fixed starting state. Yeah. And I'm that's what I'm talking about SX. here. Sx is, the m Sx is the maximum over y. Yes, OK. So, so surely if inequality holds and not equality for one y, then won't this mean that you get inequality on the maximum? So the point is this. this so this is always bounded by, right? So the right-hand side here is p of tau bigger than t. So it means that for every y, this quantity is at most p tau bigger than t. If y is a halting state, you have an equality. For, for that y. For that y. But it then means that this y m is realizing this maximum, right? Because it's, oh, okay. uh, it's bigger than uh, the, the value for every other y. OK? Sorry, I, I missed the, the definition of the halting state. OK, so. Yeah, because I only said it in words, I didn't write it. So, so why is a halting state? So halting state depends on two things, a, a stopping time tau and an initial point x. Okay, so the halting state can change according to the initial state. So if the probability starting from x of tau um, less equal than, uh, uh, than tau y is 1. So tau y is the first time that the chain reaches y. OK? OK, so tau y is the hitting time of y. 
we start at x and we want that tau y will be with probability 1 greater or equal than tau. That's the definition of a halting state for tau and x. Okay, so again, in the example of the hypercube, we started at all, all ones. The all zeros is a halt, y equals all zeros is a halting state for this uh, stopping time, um, the coupon collector stopping time and the initial state of all ones. So let me give one famous uh, example of cutoff, which is proved using um, strong stationary times. So this goes back to uh, Aldous Diaconis from the 80s. And this is top to random insertion. So this chain will be not reversible. So some of our tools disappear. Uh, it's not lazy, yet it's very easy to prove cutoff for this chain, just knowing some basics about coupon collector or about some of geometrics. So what is the chain? We have n cards in stacked. Pick a uniform, I'm sorry, take the top card, remove it from the deck and stick it in a uniform spot. So after we remove the top card, we have n minus one cards and there are n spaces because we can put it in the very bottom or at the very top. So there are these n minus one remaining cards define n spaces between them and we put the card uniformly in one of those n spaces. Okay, so that is called top to random insertion. Um, and it has cut off a time n log n with a constant of one. So we'll uh, justify that shortly. Now for the upper bound, one uses a strong stationary time. So, so here's a strong stationary time. Um, as you, you put the top card, as, uh, as you keep running the chain, the original bottom card keeps moving up. And if you think about it, the cards under the original bottom card are in random order between them. Uh, because, so suppose I have you know, uh, after I inserted, so it, it might take a while before anything goes under the bottom card. But eventually, so this is geometric with the parameter 1 over n, the time until the bottom card rises by 1. Um, then we, after it's already not the bottom card, now it's easier to get cards under it because there are two spaces there. So now it's geometric uh, with parameter 2 over n. But the two cards that will move there, um, you know, when the, the second card to move there, it has equal chance to go in each of the two spaces under it. So <laughs> when I have two cards under the original bottom card, their order between them is uniform. And you can continue this by induction. When I have k cards under the original bottom card, the k, those k cards, if I look at in what permutation they occur, all the k factorial permutations are equally likely. Okay, very easy to check by induction. So when the original bottom card reaches the top position, all the n minus 1 factorial permutations of the other cards are equally likely. And then I take this original bottom card, which is now at the top spot, remove it and put it in a uniform spot. So now everything is uniform. So it's a stationary time and it's even a strong stationary time because even if I tell you how long this process took, still everything is still true that the uh, distribution um, is completely uniform. This is a strong stationary time and it's easy to understand its mean and even its distribution because again the bottom card to rise one is geometric with parameter 1 over n, because each time you have a chance 1 over n of putting a card under there. Then, so, let me write this down somewhere. So, uh, so tau, this uh, stopping time, which is a time for bottom 
hard to reach top. And then plus one, because after that I want to make one more move. So this is a definition of tau. And tau has a distribution, which is a first geometric one over n, plus once it's at height two, I have geometric two over n, and so on. So a So, uh, so, so the expectation of tau is the sum of these expectations, and uh, this will give and this is going to be very close to n log n, asymptotic to n log n. And also, you can check, uh, for instance, by Chebyshev or by more refined ways that uh, tau is concentrated so around n log n. So the variance of tau is the, uh, you know, you can sum the variances, so it's, it's order n squared. So, so tau will vary by about n from, uh, from n log n. So it's concentrated uh, near n log n. So this means that if I weight slightly more than n log n, with very high probability, uh, tau will be, uh, will have happened already, and hence we will have mixed. So uh, now, although there is no official collecting coupons here, observe that tau is exactly, except for this, uh, yeah, tau is exactly the coupon collector time. Because if you think of the coupon collector time, time to collect the first coupon is one. The uh, next coupon, um, you know, is geometric n minus one over n, and so on. So the coupon collector time has the same distribution, except you have to sum it this way instead of this way. Comment? Okay. So, so um, okay. So this is a strong stationary time. Is it optimal? Or can you come up with a better strong stationary time? OK, I'll answer this one, but the next question I, I expect you to answer. So it's not optimal. There's a better strong stationary time. So instead of waiting for the bottom card to reach the top, and then, and then uh, make one more step, let's look at the second from bottom card. OK, so this is the card that started in the second from bottom position. Wait for it to reach the top, and then do one more step. So of course, this will happen earlier, strictly earlier. OK. So if I look at a new stopping time, tau tilde, which is the first time so that a second, second from bottom card reaches top, plus 1. So this is strictly smaller than tau. But it's still a strong stationary time, because it's also true for this one that the cards under it are in a uniform uh, random order. So initially, under it, we have the bottom card. But then the next card that comes in will come in either on top of the bottom card or below the original bottom card. So the fact that these cards are internally in uniform random order remains true for this case. So this tau tilde is better. <coughs> OK, so um, can you think of a strong stationary time that's even better than this? Maybe at this time, the, the deck will not be uniform. It w at this time, it will be uniform. So the bottom card does not have time to reach the top. So <laughs> so, 
So again, a, so the, the bottom <coughs> card could reach the top. It allows for it because, I mean, the uh, the, yeah. Now, the bottom card, for, for, you know, for the distribution to be mixed, the chance for the bottom card to be, to be at, at the very top should just be 1 over n. It shouldn't be you know, larger than that. And, and it is 1 over n because, as we said uh, in the, um, <laughs> the d before the last step, the original, you know, the second to bottom card will, you know, when, when it reaches the top, the distribution under it is uniform. So, uh, of the other cards. So, the original bottom card could be, with probability uh, 1 over n minus 1, it could be right near the top. And then, we just need the, this current top card to go to one of the locations under it, which is another factor n minus 1 over n. So the chance it will, the original bottom card will reach the top is exactly 1 over n as it should be. So this is a strong stationary time. But I'm asking, is it optimal? Yes. Well, there is a halting state for it. If you just fix some state where the second to bottom card is below the bottom card, then uh, this is the halting state. Right. So we have really a bright students here. So <laughs> thank you. So a, okay. So so let me repeat this. So we look at this the two cards, the original bottom card and the original second from bottom, uh, are going to rise together and retaining their order uh, until the original second from bottom is moved. So until this time tau tilde, so, so any state, you can name any state you want where the original second from bottom is below the original bottom, any state like that is a halting state for this tau tilde. So it means we don't have to search to see, okay, can we define in some other clever way a better stationary stop time? No, we're done. This, is, this one is optimal, and it's optimal simultaneously for all t, so it optimizes the tail for all times uh, together. So this is not obvious that you have a strong stationary time, uh, which is at the same time optimal for all, for all t. Um, one thing I should comment, uh, there is a theorem of Aldous and Iaconis that says even when you don't have a halting state, so sometimes there is no halting state, but there always is an optimal strong stationary time. So there always is one that achieves a that where the equality um, so let me get back ah, this is almost dying so equality here holds whenever you have a halting state but even in uh, but sometimes there is no halting state and um, maybe I can, I can give another exercise. Find chain so that every strong stationary time has no halting states. So I think there is such a chain with uh, three or four states. So you don't have to look for very big chains. However, in many examples there is, and then it's very useful. Okay, uh, I'm going to... Excuse me, uh, yes. so all, all of this depends on x, so uh, yes. mostly that
So let's just fix x. So for fixed x, which is the starting position, every strong, strong stationary time has no halting states. Okay, I could talk more on a uh, cutoff, but let me uh, stop this for now because I want to start telling you something about the other topic announced of this uh, theory of this uh, course, which is uh, rates of escape. Um, so, So I think, so a lot of what I'm talking about in this part of the course, you can find in chapter 13 of, of this book. Uh, so this is a book with Russ Lyons that uh, was just finished this year after some 25 years of work. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, available both from Cambridge University Press and uh, online on Russ Lyons uh, webpage, you can find the online version. So, and uh, this is actually Hugo's copy, so you can go look at it in his office uh, if you're staying around. So, uh, and I know uh, Jean-Francois has a copy as well. Um, I wish I could bring you all copies, but the carry-on, you know, doesn't, uh, <laughs> the plane would not take off, you know, so. <laughs> it's 700 pages. So, um, anyway, um, so here's a little proposition about mixing which involves a rate of escape. So let, so consider, sim a, let's say a lazy, simple random walk. So it could be actually lazy or not lazy on a, because I'm doing a lower bound on a graph G of a n nodes. Then there is a bound for the mixing time, so uh, okay. Then for any epsilon less than half, if n is large enough, then T mix of epsilon is bigger than uh, the diameter of G. squared over a constant log n. So, so contrast this with the trivial bound, which says the T mix of epsilon is bigger than the diameter. of g over 2. Okay, so the so the trivial bound follows because if I have uh, if I have two nodes uh, x and y that uh, achieve the diameter, so the distance. So when I talk about the diameter, I'm talking about the graph distance. So the distance from x to y is the number of edges in the shortest path between them. And then the diameter represents the distance, the largest distance in the graph. So we suppose the graph distance in G between x and y equals uh, d, which is the diameter. And then uh, if if t is less than the diameter over 2, then it follows that if I look at the distribution from x and from y, 
right? Their total variation distance is maximal because one is supported on the vertices that are closer to x and to y, and the other is supported on the vertices that are closer to y than to x. So this uh, total variation distance is just going to be 1 for all times. And it means that the d-bar metric, so d-bar of t is 1, but, um, uh, but d of t is bigger than half the bar of t. So remember, the d of t is the distance to stationarity, maximal distance to stationarity, while d bar is the maximal distance from two nodes. So it means that the total version distance to pi is at least is at least a half. For okay, so that's the trivial bound. But here, now the trivial bound is sometimes sharp. For for an expander, the diameter is log n, and the mixing time is order log n as well. So, um, but, you know, if we're talking about bounded degree graphs, which are a lot of the graphs we care about, then the diameter is at least log n, and then this bound um, is, uh, is at least as good as this. And often it's much better because in many graphs we know the diameter is much, much bigger than log n. And then this would be better. And also, <laughs> Uh, hints at the importance of diffusive estimates for random walks, much more general than you know, random walks in RD that we are familiar that have this diffusive behavior. So behavior, the fact that time to reach distance r is often about r squared is much more general than we are used to. And this is one example of that. Um, okay, maybe I'll put greater equal. Now, The way we'll prove this is from a very general and famous estimate, which should be even more famous, and that's the veropoulos karn bound. Uh, which has many applications. I'll show you several of them. So veropoulos karn bound, yes, it's called the veropoulos karn long-range estimate, or long-range bound. It says that for, this is from 1985. Now, this is not a joint paper. There was a first paper by Veropoulos that proved a slightly weaker version of the bound. And then in the same year, uh, motivated by that, a kind of a almost optimal version by uh, Keith Karn. So these are two separate papers. Um, and what they proved is the following. So if, um, so for, a reversible chain is all right pi p. So pi is a stationary measure and p is the transition matrix, uh, which can be finite or countable. Um, it's and let's make it, uh, let's add, let's make it irreducible. So then we, this, this can be dispensed with. So again, I remind you, reversible means that pi of x pxy is pi of y pyx. And I'm going to run, write pxy, sometimes small p, sometimes big p. It means the same thing, just a transition probability from x to y. So that's reversible. And then the inequality says that ptxy can be bounded as follows. So square root of, so there is a less important factor in the front, this ratio of transition probabilities with square root. And then uh, an important factor Let me write it and then explain. So 2 root pi y 
over pi x e to the minus distance squared from x to y over 2t. Okay, now, well, the right-hand side, it's clear what it means. This is, a, and you see a Gaussian tail. And note, there is no, is, this is not in ZD, it's completely general setting. And what is here, so ST is a simple random walk on the integers. Right, so we have this completely general reversible chain, and we can bound the individual transition probabilities at time t by the probability that a simple random walk on the integers, the most friendly object, um, has gone distance bigger than dxy. So what is dxy? So given a, long, given a reversible chain, we always have a graph where we connect x and y if we can go in one step from x to y. And reversibility means that this uh, graph is undirected. If we can go from x to y, we can go from y to x. And so this is the graph we work with, and the distance is just the graph distance here. An equivalent description of a reversible Markov chain, you can just start with a graph, put weights on the edges, and walk with probability which is proportional to the weights. So every reversible Markov chain can be described this way, and and this always yields a reversible Markov chain. Okay, but so d dxy is distance, graph distance in this graph of allowed transitions. Okay, any, any questions about this bound? Is there any like uh, continuous analog to this bound for like uh, bit kernels? Yes, in fact, uh, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, you, you're encouraged to uh, look in the original Varopoulos paper because what Varopoulos did, he took a graph, uh, he took every edge of the graph and replaced it by a pipe. And this way he obtained the manifold. And then he uh, proved that if the pipes are thin enough, random walk on the graph is well approximated by Brownian motion on this manifold. And then he used a continuous version uh, of such inequalities on this manifold to deduce the graph inequality. And, um, and there are other, so in continuous time, there are actually more variants of this that I won't go into. But uh, uh, what Karn realized is, so of course, in doing these transitions, he lost something in due to approximation errors. And then what Karn realized, what's the you know, correct discrete analog of this uh, continuous argument? And that's uh, the proof I'll show you later. Okay, now, the second inequality here is just the standard uh, Bernstein or Chernoff bound for simple random walk. It says, you know, the, the Gaussian upper bound for simple random walk. Um, so, you know, for, so you can all, you know, you can look this up in, in Wikipedia or wherever you like. So this I'm going to leave either you know it, or it's an exercise to verify it or look it up. So going from, so this is just an estimate for simple random walk on the integers, the probability it goes far. So you get it just by looking at the moment generating function of the simple random walk. So the, so of course this is not new to these 85 papers. This is you know, uh, you know, 80 years earlier or so. But, but so this is the the inequality proved in these papers. Um, so, let me, so we'll see a proof of this, but let me first tell you, uh, you know, how does it imply the mixing time bound I wrote down. very easy. Draw. So again, start with the same picture. Find in the graph. So this, applica this application is for finite graphs since I'm talking about diameter. So um, 
find x and y that realize the diameter. So the distance between x and y is capital D, which is the diameter. Uh, look at the set A, which are all the points Z, so that uh, the distance from x to z is uh, is at most uh, most d over two and. Observe that for every z and a, uh, the distance from y to z is going to be at least d over 2. Because otherwise, you'd get the contradiction to the triangle inequality, right? If the distance was strictly less than d over 2, then you'd get distance from x to y to be strictly less than d. Okay? So, and the distance from x to y is d. So, so we have that. Now, So for every z and a, what can we say about, so p, t, y, z? Is less than, uh, so we use that bound. So how, so we're talking about the graph. So, uh, so here I should have emphasized, right. So this is a lazy or simple or, uh, so it's true both for lazy and non-lazy simple random walking graph. Pi is the same, it's just given by the degrees. So the largest possible ratio of pi y over pi x is going to be a root n. So every vertex has degree at most n and at least one because I'm talking about, so I, sh okay, I should have, so when you talk about a graph, I didn't say, I want it to be connected. So my chains are irreducible and the graphs are connected. So add the word connected, uh, otherwise the mixing time doesn't even make sense. So it would be infinite. So the graph is connected. And uh, so this ratio, root pi y over, over pi x, is at most root n. And then, uh, then we have this e to the minus. The distance of x, y was the diameter over 2. So we get uh, d squared over 8t. So now, if you plug in a t, which is uh, the diameter squared g over a 16 log n. So to be precise, you have to put integer parts. I'm not writing them down, so you can add them as needed. So, but if you uh, plug in uh, this choice of time uh, into this formula, uh, right, so this is this is just d squared over 16 log n. So the d squared will cancel, and so this will become e to the minus uh, 2 log n. So overall, this will be n to the minus 3 halves, and I omitted the 2. Okay, so there's a 2 and a 2. Okay, so in other words, the transition probability from y to a is going to be um, less than 2 over root n, because the size of a is at most n, just sum over b. On the other hand, the so the same argument gives that the transition probability from x to a complement is also less than 2 over root n, because anything in a complement has distance 
bigger than d over 2 from x. So it's exactly the same argument, gives us this bound. And now if I look at d bar of um, d bar of t, it's bigger than the distance pt xa minus pt uh, ya. So it's bigger than 1 minus 2 over root n minus another 2 over root n, right, just by these inequalities. So 1 minus 4 over root n. So, so you see that this is going to be uh, close to 1 provided n is large. So you know, d of t is going to be bigger than half of that, so half minus 2 over root n. And so you see that uh, for any epsilon less than half, you have the, if epsilon is strictly less than half and n is large enough, we get this inequality. Okay, so we'll start uh, the ne next class with a proof of a uh, Varopoulos Karn inequality, it, uh, the shortest proof, which is the original Karn proof, um, is a surprising use of Chebyshev polynomials. And uh, the nice thing is it uses Chebyshev polynomials, but it does, you don't need to know any theorems about Chebyshev polynomials. Just the definition of Chebyshev polynomials does, does the work. It's quite a remarkable proof. I would say that, um, so, uh, you know, in, in uh, some 30-something 30, 30 years of doing mathematics, this, I would say, is my favorite theorem. Uh, it's not my theorem, but the theorem I like the most, because it's so useful, and I'll show you several applications, and the proof is uh, so beautiful. So you'll see it in the first 10-15 uh, minutes of uh, the next lecture. Um, and then I'll show you uh, one more application to, um, to random walks on groups. So, uh, that, uh, so this was application was already described in Varopoulos' original paper that a random walk has positive on a group. So think of an infinite group. There's a version for finite groups as well. Uh, it has positive speed if and only if the entropy uh, grows linearly. So the non-trivial direction of that follows from this inequality. Okay, so we'll continue tomorrow. Right. It has to be a strong stationary time. Yes. Could this also work if you have like an almost stationary time? So yes. Okay. Yes, it also works it's, if it's almost stationary, provided the chain is either lazy or continuous time. Yeah.